Hello and welcome to the second episode of Interwoven, the podcast from The Weave. We're so glad to have you back and we have been thrilled by the response that we've got from our first episode. My name's Adam Roxby and I'm the Director of Communications here at The Weave and we just wanted to let you know that if you want to add your thoughts or your comments or just be a part of the show then we'll let you know how to do that at the end of the episode. As you may notice, I haven't got my co-host with me today, Alex. She's a little bit busy at the moment, but we just wanted to share with you the content that we've got for this episode as soon as possible. So let's not keep you in suspense any longer and tell you what we've got coming up for episode two. Well, Alex had the opportunity to chat with Sarah McKee Harris, who runs her own HR consultancy group. We also hear from Lisa Ansell from Sales Geek and she gives a few great tips on how you can improve your sales technique. And finally, our very own James Cracknell gives a really in-depth book report on one of the most fundamental business books you can read. So without further ado, let's get going with our first piece, which is the interview that Alex had with Sarah McKee Harris. Sarah and welcome to the Interwoven podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing about you and your business and how it all got started and set up. So tell me a little bit about your business, the Kingswood Group, and what you're all about and how it got started. Yes, so Kingswood Group is my company and I established it back at the end of 2018. Uh, My career before that was primarily in recruitment, and I've always specialised in working with HR professionals uh, within that industry, both in London and outside, and and worked with small businesses through to large international global firms. I'm really passionate about recruitment. And and when I first started the business, that's what it was. It was just me doing HR recruitment in my bedroom at home, like a lot of people where they start. Uh, But quite quickly, uh, after six months, and um, we started to get busier and busier, and I I decided to take on my first employee, uh, who was a part-time administrator. And um, and then since then, the the business has just continued to to organically grow. And um, after the first year, we say we, I always say we, it feels feels good saying we, but I, at the time, (laughs) decided um, to uh, extend the business offering and... um, this was just largely due to working uh, a lot with local businesses and doing a lot of local business networking and realizing that they didn't need me to recruit them an HR person because they weren't actually big enough um, to need that on a, on a permanent basis. But they still needed that employee HR support. So I actually saw the opportunity and decided to hire a qualified HR manager. And we then began to offer outsourced HR support services on a mm. ongoing and consultancy basis and that's where Kingswood Group is now still at the moment so we're very much a recruitment and HR services support business and we're now a team of seven and we're all based in Essex and um, we're all working well together but but continuing to look at growing the business. I noticed you mentioned a couple of times that it grew, it's grown organically. So how did it sort of start? Did you have a vision to begin with or was it just a case of we'll just see what happens and now here we are? So my primary reason for starting Kingswood Group, having had you know a long term corporate career um, largely in the city, was I have a, I have a son and um, from a previous marriage. And at the time he was eight and I went back to work uh, quite quickly after having him back into the city. So uh, over those eight years, I felt like I'd really not had the opportunity to spend much time with him. So my primary focus and reason for going alone was to, and you'll laugh at this because I have less time now, was to actually spend more time with my family. Um, <laughs> so it, and, and I do in a way because I have a lot more flexibility and mm-hmm. um opportunity to make my own decisions about where I am what I'm doing uh but as kids get older they need you less and less so uh yeah. he, he's he's 12 now uh, but it, it's great to be to be around and, and also to show him 
what you can do and um you know to, to be a strong female leader in his life mm. so Fabulous. It's, it's so important, isn't it? Like, so I'm going to go on a slight tangent here because this is something I'm really keen about is as a female in the in the world of work, it's really, well, I say as a female, I know dads have the same issue as well. It's really hard to be able to balance that kind of desire to like have kids and raise a family and spend all that time, but also have your career and have um, something to aim for. Is there something about running your own business that felt like that made it easier? It's interesting you say that because for me, a lot of it is in your control. Um, mm. I am quite an ambitious person. I, I, you know, recruitment is sales. So I'm very target driven. I'm always looking, you know, ahead, you know, for the for the next target to to me. And I come from a family where uh, my mother was a, an accountant and she ran a, a, an accountancy practice with my stepdad, and then they sold that business. So I guess I've always grown up with knowing what you can do as, as a business mm. owner. Being a mum, uh, there's pros and cons. There's pros and cons. I, I know a lot of people that actually decided when they became parents, they changed careers and go and work in a school because that worked mm. better for them with term time. And I completely get that as well. And, and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It, it really comes down to what what's important to you, what your priorities are at home and at work, and then seeing if there's a way you can you can find the balance that works for you. Mm. Just this morning, I was meeting with a, a a senior accountant in the local area who people have been saying to us for ages, oh, you should really get together. I think you two would really get on. And, and, and from talking to her, she used to run her own business. And actually, after her first child, she was approached to go and, back and work in a big firm and, and actually took quite some time to really think about it because she loved running her own business. But again, like me, she was quite ambitious and it was just getting busier and busier and busier. And so she felt that actually going back into a large firm at that point in her life was the right thing for her to do. So it does go both ways. There is no right or wrong. Like with all parenting, there's no right or wrong, really. No, exactly. Um, (laughs) That's the most frustrating thing about it. There is no right or wrong answer. Yeah, Um, exactly But it's just trying to find, you know, and and if you're lucky enough to, find the right opportunity that works for you. Tell me a bit about the best bit about running your business currently. Uh, the best bit, well, there's lots actually, I'm not going to lie. I would say now I have a team and I'll be honest with you, I had never even managed one person before I set up King's Group. I was always standalone, always, you know, consultant, never had to look after anybody else, just myself. At first, that was really challenging, but actually also is now the most rewarding. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think a lot of business leaders will understand where I'm coming from. People management is probably the hardest job you'll ever do. Because yep, I hear that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but it is also the most rewarding at times as well because you know you build a relationship with people, you can see uh, where their skills are, you know you can get to understand what their what their drivers are, and and again you can then hopefully you know, create those opportunities for them and work with them, and where possible give them great reward and recognition. That is probably the most rewarding thing is is actually people people actually looking up to you and being and looking to you for for leadership. It's it's scary, but it's also great at the same time. I have to say, I, I manage a team as well, and that is definitely the best bit of my job as well, and the most yeah. challenging. So, yes. <laughs> <definitely> <laughs> <hear that. laughs> and um, moving on to that, what would you say is the most difficult part of running your business? The most difficult bit. And this is probably where we're still fairly early on. You know, we're only four and a half years old and we're still quite a lean team Mm. uh, is the hats, the many, many hats that you are Mm. and the plates that you are spinning all at the same time. And it gets to the end of the month, every month. And you think, oh, my God, payday's coming. And you're looking, you're looking at your digital accounting software. I won't name any names. (laughs) And you're thinking, okay, but all this money that's been invoiced so cash flow is where I'm going with this mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. that's the the hardest bit I think um and I've got a great finance manager and I, I made a decision to bring that person in to the business uh, about mm-hmm. just over a year ago and it, and it was a really good decision to make because we're, we're much more in control of things and forecasting and all that really adult stuff that we didn't mm-hmm. have before but it's actually really helpful in, in running a business and um so yeah that's still the, the scariest bit for me and and so it's it's just that uh, you know you are responsible for seven other people's salaries, you know, and and yeah. those people have bills to pay, 
And um, although we, we've been good, you know, over the years, you know, we, we launched about a year and a half before COVID and then we, we were able to ride that out. And, you know, we've, we've had year on year growth, which is mm-hmm. is great. I've never, ever felt completely, oh, it's fine, we're good, you know, because there's always something <laughs> happening or yeah. an, another project that I'm thinking of doing, which is going to cost a bit of money. And then I'm thinking about resources. So it is a juggling act. Um, but my my advice is, based on what we've done, is, is to get those really strong foundations in around finances and, and reporting and structure and process, because then it's just so much easier and less stressful when you kind of get to those milestones. Yeah. I mean, you obviously mentioned about the finance manager you bought in a year ago. How do you feel you set up those foundations at the start? Because obviously, as you say, generally you're just wearing, it's just you or it's just you and one other and you're wearing so many hats. Did you get any support in that? Did you get any guidance? I'm a little bit lucky in the fact that my mum and dad are accountants. Um, oh, yes. However, however, they um, had retired. And I'm saying that in inverted commas for anybody that's listening because uh, you wouldn't know it now. They're both busier than they ever were when they were running their own practice. But they knew the foundations to help me you know, get the business set up, set up a bank account. I did early on still have an accounting business. So I met with that accountant really on. They quickly put me onto um, some digital accounting software, which even for me, because even though I come from a family of accountants, I am rubbish with numbers. I seem to have some sort of mental block with it. So I don't know what happened there. It kind of missed me in the, in the genetic <laughs> process. Um Damn it. But I know, <laughs> right? Um, I, I'm gutted about that. My advice is to to try and create a bit of a circle of trust around you of, of experts who mm. who you can comfortably talk to and not feel silly about things. I'm quite a humble person. If I'm if I don't know, I'll tell people I don't know. And and most people really want to help you. I think if you ask for help, most people will give it. And uh, that again is is really important to do. Don't. Don't be embarrassed that you don't know something. There is loads of great resources online, you know, and I could easily just Google something. That actually having somebody to actually just break it down and explain it in layman's terms is actually more helpful for me. And again, it does depend on how you learn. I'm quite a visual person. I like to talk things through. Other people aren't, you know, and they like to do their research and they like to know the numbers and they like to see the facts around things. Mm -hmm. So it's just you do have to understand yourself first before you then can look at how you obtain and and find information but definitely get a great accountant on board first and then my next step after that was um finding a business coach and um I also then when I brought finance in-house I also uh, brought marketing in-house as well so they they were quite fundamental things yeah oh and IT IT is really important I, I outsource that yeah (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah that's really it's I I actually I met um, and interviewed a business coach um, a little while ago and one of the things that he said which really stuck in my mind was entrepreneurs get stuck at the point where they stop where they don't ask for help so essentially when you hit the point where either you don't have the time or the expertise it's really easy to then get stuck there because you can't you can't move and actually Mm. bringing someone in probably a bit earlier than you think you need them is very useful whether that's just as you say like um an expert that you have sort of on tap or um actually employing someone so yeah Yeah. it's really interesting advice from you and there's lots of ways to do that I, i agree with with that business coach um when i first started before i took on that first employee i did need admin help quite quickly because i in my role my value that where I was most valuable was out Mm -hmm. selling the business and delivering the work. My time was not best spent doing the admin behind it all. So I did, uh, first of all, use a virtual assistant. That's Mm -hmm. quite a good way to do it. So you look at flexible outsourced offerings first. Yeah. And then you can work out then whether that is a permanent position whether you need someone on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis, just helps you kind of scope out the need rather than a knee-jerk reaction. Oh my God, I need, you know, I need a PA mm. on a full-time permanent basis, which is going to go onto your payroll. You've got all those extra costs. You've then got a salary to deliver on every month. You've then got hours you need to fill with that person. So there's loads of flexible resources out there now, which means that you don't have to take on the risk and the cost straight away. 
That's really interesting and so useful for when you're when you're starting out, I'd imagine. And HR, of course. Um, yeah. And that's where we help. That's where we help a lot of businesses is when they're taking on their first employees or uh, they've taken all of their friends and family and they've run out of friends and family, so they now need to start doing things properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's where the people management. So once you've once you then kind of got past that point, think right now I am. It is better for me to take that person on on a permanent basis. That's when you need to then get a bit more serious because you'll need a contract mm. of employment and you'll need to start doing things properly. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely something that I know nothing about, really. <laughs> so, um, it is yeah, a minefield. So. In the future, absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, when you're in your business, you'll come up with occasional problems and challenges and things that you're not really sure how to solve. What's your favourite way of trying to solve that? Do you do it on your own, in a group? Is there a certain method you do? Yeah, I'm quite a collaborative leader. I, I'm also uh, quite, I overthink things. Uh, so I, I do, there's a few different things I do. So if I've got an issue, first of all, I will think it through and, and think, is that really an issue? I like to do that by going for a walk and putting some music on and getting away from the office or the computer or the phone and just getting some headspace to mull that over and to think it through. And actually sometimes that helps resolve the issue because then I think, oh, mm. I just speak to so-and-so. Um, other times if I'm really struggling, depending on what the issue is, if it's a kind of internal thing where maybe we are struggling to deliver on something or we've got a, a client issue that I've, I'm not sure where it's come from or what we do with it, I do then get the team together and I speak to the team and we have a little chat about things and come up with some ideas between us. Otherwise, as I said, I do have a business coach and um, it took me a long time to find my business coach, a few years, in fact, because the business coach is a really personal thing. You've, you've got to have trust and you've got to have respect in that relationship. And there are a lot of business coaches out there, or people who call themselves business coaches. And, and again, it's it's like finding a partner. You, no one's perfect for everybody. You've got to find your one. So mm-hmm. it did take me a while, but I'm, I'm really pleased I did. And and. Our relationship um, means that I can call her and just be like, got this issue. This is what I'm thinking. This is what the team think. Any ideas you're in? So rather than going straight to her, um, we do try to find out ourselves. One thing I always go back to, and I know it sounds really cheesy, is our values and my own personal values and the business values. And if it doesn't feel right, and I, I use that a lot. If it doesn't feel right, I do go by, a lot by kind of values and my gut, then it's normally not right. However, you know, I do then seek that information just to kind of guide we, as a team, because we we as a team came up with those values. It wasn't just me going, that one sounds nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it was blood, sweat and tears coming up with those values and our purpose. Uh, generally speaking, we because of that, all decisions circle around those values and if it doesn't meet those values and fit those values then generally we won't do it that's interesting yeah and it's the same with the people we work with our suppliers our our clients even purchasing decisions i make is still linked to those values when in the process did you do that was that one of the things you did very early on early yeah, yeah. really early on i'd probably say after the it was like the first about the first year to 18 months once we mm-hmm. had enough people in the team for it to be something we could do collectively, mm. I had an idea and I'd put some on the website when I first started the business, but we changed them. We, we sat down and, and we we came up with some new ones that reflected us and the business. Well, that must have been a really interesting transition, actually, because you'd obviously gone from you on your own solo with your own views and thoughts to then you're kind of merging that with some people that you'd recruited who obviously you trusted because otherwise you wouldn't have recruited them but kind of merging those brains into then one collective idea was it was it very far away from what you'd come up with originally no no I don't think it was the ones I chose were really generic like first of all Mm. you know the, the ones that everybody has um and it just it didn't have the right meaning and and again I think Certainly nowadays, when you think about what businesses are there for and how people choose who they work with, 
there needs to be authenticity in in those values and if you say that you do something on your website and then you act completely differently you're yeah. going to lose that respect so that's why I personally think it's a really important thing to do I know other people think oh it's just a tick box exercise and that's fine and that will get you so far yeah but it's a really good way to to kind of confirm what you're doing and why you're doing it and then it helps with everything like the messages you're sending out in comms your employer brand your marketing how people behave your policies because it just they all fit together so I don't want people to think that's all fluffy soft and fluffy I genuinely like it actually helps me make business decisions serious business decisions have you got an example like um okay so we um the first time I've ever had to tell a client we're not going to work with (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) oh my god I was so nervous oh it was horrible and and it was weird (laughs) because this client had come to us as well they'd come to us and they we'd gone through a tendering exercise and it was us against with with other HR companies and we were really chuffed when we won this client and we started you know we started the relationship and we met with them but at the time I think it must have been sort of at the tail end of COVID because they were down one end of the county and we were into the other and so we hadn't actually met in person it was all kind of done virtually at that stage and um, we met with them we started working with them but it was this really weird vibe every time we spoke to them it was kind of quite negative and mm. confrontational from their side mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we were like oh, that's, that's a bit weird it's like they don't want to work with us but we've just been through this process they came to us they chose us so it's kind of mulling it over and then I started to get some messages from the owner and he started to not in a direct way but in an indirect way bad mouth my consultant and Mm. He was like, I'm not happy with this. This person's doing this. I'm not sure about this. And, and it just didn't sit right. And so for me, I was starting to get the feeling that this wasn't this wasn't right. And we weren't aligned mm. um, in in how we work together. And, and for me, the team's really important. One of our values is around kind of integrity. And I started to question that kind of value. And I wasn't prepared to to have that happening. So it got really uncomfortable. And I just thought, I've got to just cut ties here. Mm. So I ended up just having it. And, and then the other one is is honesty. <laughs> and I'm a very, very honest person. And I just said, look, can we have a meeting? And uh, I just let, you know, not sure what's going on, getting this kind of feedback from you. And I said, I don't think we should continue working together. And he had no issues with that at all. And I was like, can I just ask <laughs> why did you why did you ask to work with us he was like oh our finance director told us we had to <laughs> I was like oh wow oh, okay. Right, okay that makes sense completely sense. yeah but it was hard because that was that was yeah. a good client big big client good money you know we hadn't long started the HR business and um but it just you know you it didn't align it didn't align yeah. to us at all and there's there's loads of things that I can pull on around that but that one just sprung into my head um yeah the other one I, is around tenacity you know we we really you know we're very solutions focused and we and we don't give up you know we, we're very mm. tenacious creative um in finding a way to help people mm-hmm. um, whether we can do that ourselves or we then need to find other people to help them so I think we do that quite a lot in our recruitment division because finding the people sometimes is extremely difficult so you have to kind of think outside the box and kind of be a bit more how, how else can we look at this and and then trying to work with the client to, to find another another route to market it's a very brave decision to kind of take a client who's been essentially that you feel like you're not aligned with and and stop it but it goes back to I think what you said about being able to sleep at night like mm. you want to run a business that you feel is good for you and good for your team and good for you know yeah. the world and yeah. if you are sort of going against those values then you can't do that it's funny you talked about bravery because I have a big sign on my wall that I'm looking at now which is it's got a big word that says courage and it says mm-hmm. it says noun derived from the latin word meaning heart which is to be courageous is to speak and act from your heart 
And mm. this again comes back to those values. And, I, and again, I don't want it to sound all cheesy and fluffy because some <laughs> people will be listening to this going, oh my God, what is this? what's this girl all about? But genuinely, like it, your life will be so much easier if you're just true to yourself. Like, just understand mm. yourself and then just stick with that. You don't need to pretend to be something different mm-hmm. because then, one, you can't keep it up, and two, people will see through it. Mm. You won't build those really strong, meaningful relationships that are really helpful to have in business. There's room for everyone, right? Yeah. So for yeah. for every you know one type of person, there's also people who want the exactly. other type. So exactly, yeah. there's plenty of business to go around. You know, yes, it's <laughs> a very good thing to do. <laughs> With your business, what impact would you love to have at HR Kingsford Group in the future? I'm very passionate about good people management and um, Mm -hmm. getting the best out of your people and just valuing your workforce in general. Um, Something we, again, this is one of our four values is sustainability. Now, I know that word gets chucked around all over the place nowadays, but we're coming at it from from a people perspective. So we have the three pillars of sustainability, Mm -hmm. which is people, planet, profit. Everyone knows how to recycle. Everyone knows how to, you know, not everyone. I'm still struggling with it. Measuring my carbon footprints. Um, yeah. You know, we can plant some trees with our profits. But what do you do with people? What does what does sustainable people mean? Mm-hmm. So we're, we're very passionate about that. And, and sustainable people is really just thinking about your people in your business, taking some time to understand what they need, what environment they're working in, how to support them. And if you do all of that, you can recruit better, you can keep them longer. And if you develop them, you will retain them as well. And, and it's, you know, it's the, it's the whole employee life cycle and, and you can look at mm. reward and recognition. Um, you can support them with um, well-being, mental, physical, financial. So all of this, which is mm-hmm. basically what HR is, yeah. right? is creating a sustainable people base and people and, and workforce. So that's something we're really passionate about. And actually, I'm, I'm looking into some courses um, to understand how I can educate myself better on, on sustainable people, sustainable HR. I think for the future businesses, the, the businesses that are coming through now with, with new generations, uh, it's a really important thing for them and the mm. purpose you know, having a strong purpose of business is really going to help you attract and retain people. Um, and then investing in your people. You don't need to spend a lot of money. to. When I say invest, everyone thinks, oh, my God, it's going to cost me a fortune. You don't have to spend yeah. a lot of money to invest in your people. You can just say thank you a bit more. That's for free. You mm. can, look, you know, ask them what they would find useful uh i did an employee benefit survey for my team last year we're a small business so i don't have tons of money to to chuck at fancy things uh they quite wanted to have a well-being day they wanted to uh look at uh doing some voluntary work they mm. uh were interested in having a more flexible approach to work i mean we already do offer home home working flexible working and everyone in my team apart from me works some kind of part-time flexible mm. hours I just work 24-7, but that's what business owners do, right? Because we don't care. <laughs> um, you know, those things didn't cost a lot of money. It's just a few tweaks here and there. But now they, they're more engaged, so they're more productive, which means that they're earning you more money, right? Mm. So all of these things impact the bottom line in a positive way, but don't necessarily cost the employer a lot. Yeah, there's loads of other stuff you can do. You can chuck a perk box at them or you can give them a fancy private health insurance thing. But when you're first starting out as a business, you can't afford to do that normally. Mm. So you have to be a bit more creative. But it's a case of asking and listening and acting. And yeah. uh, sometimes it's the listening and acting bit that, that doesn't happen. And then you end up going the other way and having a demotivated, disengaged workforce because you haven't bloody listened to what you asked them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you asked a question and then ignored then the answers. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So that's, that's quite it. common. Yeah. Um, so in terms nice. of what I want, I want businesses to really recognize the value of their people. You wouldn't have a business if it wasn't for your people doing the yeah. business, customer services, warehouse staff, uh, drivers, you know, any, it doesn't have to be an office based person, mm. be a logistics, it could be anything, but your, your people are doing that work for you. If yeah. you don't look after them and keep them, you won't have a business. 
What a lovely, what a lovely way to to round on the, off the conversation. Although um, I've got to finish off, if you'd be game, a little quick fire round. Okay, for I'll that? try. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too personal, I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first question, what's your favourite band? Snow Patrol. I've got um, so many, but that one just popped into my head. Yeah. <laughs> well done. What's the last film or series you watched? Currently watching The Devil's Hour, which is really scary. Oh, I haven't it's watched it. It's very good. It's on Prime. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, what meal would you choose to have on your birthday? A steak. Oh, nice. <laughs> medium, medium rare or well done? Medium rare. Fill it. Nice. Medium rare. Oh, the lovely. Bernays sauce. It has to be Bernays sauce. <laughs> nice. Um, what reading material would you recommend to other entrepreneurs or, star- or business owners? Um, I read a really interesting book called Profit First. And oh, okay. um, that was quite an interesting. I'm really sorry. I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but it's quite a, a well-known book. Because mm. a lot of businesses, when they start out, they just constantly reinvest the profit. So they never really and, and sort of gain that. So mm. the profit first is just, it's a different way of accounting. Oh my God, that means I've read an accounting book. <laughs> but it's, it's a way of, of it's, you, you have to put profit first. Why else are you in business, right? You're not in business just mm. to keep, you know, paying everybody else and not, not benefiting yourself. So profit first is kind of, turns it sort of flips the way you you look at accounting slightly so that you are actually taking a profit from the word go interesting okay that sounds like something i need to read (laughs) and um lastly the best piece of advice you've ever been given this is an easy one don't worry about things you can't control oh that's a good one honestly on my first manager told me uh he was probably one of my worst managers but that little gem (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> stuck with stuck. me and um, because I used to worry about everything I used to freak out all the time and couldn't sleep and and he just said look what are you worrying about and I was like I did this and this he's like but can you control any of that and I was like no he goes why are you worrying about it I'm like mm. yeah I think about that <laughs> so that really does you know resonate now yeah. everything I think about is can I do anything about it you know, we all worry about what's going out on in the world, you know. Can I do anything about that? I mean, there might be something tiny you can do, changing your mm-hmm. buying habit or something. But generally speaking, no. Yeah. <laughs> so just get on with things. Yeah. Go on. Live your best life. You only get one go and all that. Yeah. Right. Focus on the now. Love it. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Sarah, last thing, if people are interested in your um, your business and maybe want to find out a bit more, how can they get in touch with you? You can visit our website, which is www.kingsofgroup.org, mm-hmm. or you can uh, contact me, which is sarah at kingsofgroup.org, and um, I'd happily answer any questions, uh, have an initial free chat about any HR or recruitment question or issue you might have. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been absolutely a pleasure talking to you today. You too. Thank um, you for having me. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thanks very much. Take care. I really, really love this interview and I can really resonate with the uh, difficulties in trying to find the balance between making your own business and trying to be a present person as a parent. You know, I've got I've had similar experiences myself, so I'm sure many of you who are listening can resonate with that. Now, one of our community members is Lisa Ansel, and she is from Sales Geek, and she's got a little bit of time in her very busy schedule to give you a few quick tips and hopefully whet your appetite about sales and how you can improve your technique. So this is for all our geeky fans and followers. We at Sales Geek are on a mission to transform the way the world perceives sales. And we're making sure that people focus on the needs of their client base rather than on their own agenda because it doesn't work as a sales practice. So what's the best thing I can tell you today in a very short period of time? Nine out of 10 Companies, entrepreneurs, startups, pre-startups that I speak with do not understand their differentiation or what people term as a USP or a unique selling point. Unfortunately, a USP is really, really rare because there are very few unique points out there. 
um, that are exclusive to that particular person so or company. So it means that you need to find a differentiator. So if you don't know your differentiator, what makes you different to every other pro similar product or service out there, whatever business, and it can't just be you, all right, because that's what people boil down to. Ask yourself, what is your USP? Do you have a USP? Ask yourself what makes you completely different from the other people that are doing the same things that you do or that you're selling your product, your service, whatever it is. Because if you don't know that, you don't know why people are going to buy. You cannot, you cannot work out why people are going to buy from you. All right? And if you can't work out why people are going to buy from you, you can't market to those people and if you can't market to those people you can't sell to those people if you can't sell to those people do you know what you're not going to survive you know you're going to bob along you'll you'll have people coming to you who are looking for a product or services the shoppers and you'll be taking uh you'll be taking orders you'll be order taking that's what most companies do they order take rather than actually sell effectively to their marketplace and grow the way they want to. So if you want to know more about how to do that, you can book some free time in with me. You can look up our free sales app or you can join our, our academy for a very, very small amount of money. But ask me how. Book in. Engage with me. I'm always open. We're really lucky to have Lisa as part of our community and there's also lots of information in the community if you want to join up and have a look at our events and some of the events that are run by SalesGeek as well as the publications that you can download and learn more. If you want to be a part of our free community then you can just simply head to wearetheweave.co.uk sign up there and then you'll be given access to all of the information. There's tons of stuff there, far too much for me to go into in just this episode but check it out. I'm sure you'll get a lot from it. We're going to close this episode with a really in-depth book report from James Cracknell. So take it away, James. Welcome to the Interwoven Book Review. Um, this is where we, on a monthly basis, uh, take a look at um, a particular piece of reading that we've been involved with, made a significant difference perhaps to the way that we um, engage with um, our work and made, had a significant impact perhaps on our lives as well. We do a lot of reading at The Weave and we believe fundamentally that it's like having a mentor in your pocket. It's the best way of, uh, one of the best ways of engaging with fresh ideas and learning and it can often contextualize our thoughts and our thinking and it can make us very sort of kind of reflective on the particular journey that we've been on. Back in 2011, I was made redundant from a 28-year career in finance. It was a momentous occasion for me because uh, although I probably felt that it was on the cards, I really didn't know whether it was going to happen and what that experience was going to be looking like. And I think at that particular point, it was um, the year of my 50th birthday. Um, I'd been made redundant once before, but my, by the time I got home off the train, things had pretty much stabilized and I'd been offered another role. But I knew this time I didn't want to go back. I knew I wanted to actually go forward and deliver something different in my life, but I had absolutely no idea, no clarity about what that might look like. And it's pretty scary when you're going through a change like this. I think there are lots of ways that you can um, cope with it. And I I think finding and leaning into the work of other people is hugely important. This particular book that we're going to talk about is a book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Now, many people have read it. It's a very, very popular book. Probably if you haven't read it, you may have even seen Simon Sinek's TED Talk uh, and engaged with that. Simon is one of these people that's, that um, is a, a great thought leader and um, has written a number of subsequent books that have expanded on this particular area, but also developed his own thoughts and style of leadership. And I think it's very relevant for the world that we live in today. When I started to read it, and it's not a particularly long book, um, it, it became very much a guiding light to the way that I felt and the way that I wanted to focus on different things. So it's a book that really kind of brings together a deeper understanding about our driving force. And, and we call it within the book, or Simon Sinek calls it within the book, our why. I think it probably is 
inherently slightly more than just a purpose, but it's there. It, it's, it encompasses our beliefs, our values, um, the things at the end of the day that are core to who we are and, um, and what matters to us. And I think this is, again, one of the, the clear things about purpose and drive in any aspect of our lives. And that is that it's dynamic. It changes. You know, what drove me when I was 50 and um, thinking about my future was very, very different to what was driving me when I was in my mid-teens, late teens, early 20s, you know, I, these are very different contextual moments to actually start to think about it. But what you can say about this book, and it highlights some of the elements that, you know, have become central to um, to the way that we communicate and the way businesses today really communicate. And I think it aided myself in the discovery of my own personal objectives in life and culminated ultimately in what we're trying to achieve within the weave. So I think the thing about to start with why model is, is that, that it takes us back and it asks us some really true core questions. It asks us to identify what our core values are. And there, you know, it gets us to think through those particular moments, those areas where what, what really matters, truly matters to us and what drives us is, is something that um, we can uncover, that we can think through from that perspective. It is a bit of a cliche, but it is also asking us to say, well, okay, this is our authentic self. This is something at the end of the day, as a leader, as a person, as an individual that wants to do something more with their lives, we have to be authentic. And I think when you leave or exit a career in, a, in an industry that may have defined your role and you've left that particular role, you feel very vulnerable. Your boundaries are very different. They've pretty much become hugely porous and often the outside world becomes to a, it becomes a situation which dwarfs our progression and our way forward. So this book really did help me, particularly in me, I think it helped a number of different people, but helped me um, really engage with my core values and understanding what really mattered to me. So the book encourages the reader to delve into their personal motivations and discover this unique sense of purpose, a unique voice that we have. And by understanding our why um, and what we do with it, and we can infuse more meaning into our life and work um, in a different way, in a purposeful way. And I think that, again, was hugely crucial, particularly as I was going through a process of education. I was looking at leadership. I was looking at where I fitted in, what I could offer to our local region, to our local community. Um, and I had a tendency to con to consider what I had done in the past as having limited value for what was going on in the future. But I think it, that, again, was something which this particular book helped me strip away, helped me strip away some of the pretenses and, and the inhibiting factors that were stopping me moving my life forward. So Start With Why highlights this importance of a clear vision, of a clear vision of one's life and asking us to visualize this pathway, the one that we want to travel, to set these objectives in life and to um, make certain decisions and, and identify certain outcomes that align um, with the activity of today with our long-term objectives in the future. And that's a philosophy that we've taken with us and a philosophy that I think that we inherently have within the we. When we say that we're, it's about being purposeful. It's about using our activity, using our skills, the low hanging fruit, the things at the end of the day that we can use to get us over the hurdles of tomorrow, overcome those barriers to progression and delivery. The outcome uh, of all of this is that, and I, I think if you engage with Simon Sinek's golden circle and you look at that idea of a central purpose why that sits in the middle, the how, how we're different, how we bring novelty, uniqueness into our world, and then what we do, in other words, the job that we inherently deliver. And I think from that perspective, this whole kind of area is a communication strategy. And that is something which, again, has become fundamental and foundational to the way that the Weave then delivers its support and its mechanisms of support through the accelerator programs, through the way that we talk about it. The we get businesses to understand what it is that they're driving, that's driving them and driving the business, the impact that they're trying to create. And this book is the foundation, probably, of that particular piece of thinking and that work.
So by understanding your why and being able to articulate it with passion and power, um, we can influence others. We can influence ourselves. We can influence the others to become more uh, inclusive of what we're about. And we can connect with others um, who share that passion, that value, those values, that direction. And I think that, again, is another area. Finding people, when you speak to people with, an, with, with real authenticity and passion, you get buy-in. You get people who are really interested. So I would suggest if you haven't read the book, please do. If you want to sort of find out more about the core premise, the golden circle, the, the, the concepts that Simon has further developed in other books that he's written, then engage with the TED Talks, engage with his other work, find him on LinkedIn, certainly follow him on LinkedIn, because I think from that perspective, um, you won't be disappointed with a lot of what he says in terms of that. And so I think many, just finishing off, I think the thing about this is many readers do appreciate the wisdom in, on those pages. This isn't new. This is fundamentally, you know, what a lot of people have been doing before. But he has a tendency, a bit like my Malcolm Gladwell, of taking the obtuse and creating clarity around it. And he is a very articulate, clear speaker who really does take you on that particular personal and professional growth journey. And I think that's really crucial. So engage with it. Do share your ideas within the community. Um, reach out to me, James Cracknell, or Adam, or anybody within the community, just simply to engage with the ideas. So thank you very much. Have a great month and speak soon. Now, anybody who's spent any time with The Weave knows that we are a great fan of Simon Sinek. We've used some of his videos in the past as a really great way of highlighting just how a simple change in your mindset and a change in your approach can alter the way in which you conceptualize not only the things that you do in your own life but also in your business and as somebody who's read this book well I say I've read the book I've had it dictated you can get the audio book which is narrated by Simon himself which is really sort of a, a powerful way of consuming it and as James said it's not a particularly long book but the amount of information and the value that you get from just a short amount of information is really really powerful so Check it out. Let us know what you've thought of it in the community or in the comments and would really love to continue this journey. I'm looking forward actually to the next episode when we'll find out more about another book which will help you in your business journey. Like I said, a little bit of a shorter episode this time around, but if you want to continue the conversation, continue the learning and continue the development of yourself and your business, then just head over to wearetheweave.co.uk and join the free community I mentioned earlier. As well as being given access to the resources that will help you grow, you can also interact with other people who are on a similar journey as yourself there's also newsletters, blogs, podcasts, white papers, and in-depth book analysis, as well as weekly events to help you grow and develop. Tons of stuff there, all for free. So that's weartheweave.co.uk. But before we go, let's have a little look at what's coming up in the next episode. Well, in episode three, we'll be bringing you an interview with a prolific author, entrepreneur and a lifetime advocate for saving the planet. That is the one, the only, the great John Elkington. He studied and graduated actually from the University of Essex and now works with the world's largest organizations to bring home the message from his own turn of phrase, People, Planet, Profit, absolute gem of a guest. And that is a really special interview to look out for next time around. So it just leaves for me to say thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you all in the community. Until next time, I'll see you on the inside. Bye for now.